Yeah, that'd be great. Let's just make sure that we're. Oh, there we are. Ready? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we're streaming now. Is that correct? Yes. All right. We are. Um, well, welcome to Classic Quests. Yeah, this is exciting. So, look, uh, I'm, so this is a stream that uh, Scott and I came up. My name is Chris. I'm here. Uh, at, we're up in the Digital Collaboratory at, at C21 at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Go uh, Panthers. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, they're... Uh, I think their tennis team starts. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's coming up. Stay tuned. Uh, so we're we wanted to do a stream that focuses no, on nothing but uh, classic role playing games of uh, what we've recently come to sort of believe is computer games golden uh, age. Yeah, that, that's what I was gonna look up. Um, I think go ahead. I'm, I'm going to look up. So what I'm looking up right now is that uh, there's an academic at the uh, University of St. Cloud called Matt Barton who wrote a book, um, Desktops and Dungeons. Well, actually, so he actually did give a chronology to what age um, games came in. Uh, we kind of talked about what we don't really know. I mean, I don't know how you would define what age you know how you would create a timeline for these so he, this is according to Matt this is in the Bronze Age interesting so I think he's saying that this so the game that we, we I don't think we mentioned yet is well I guess there's a big title stream is a Calabeth <laughs> uh, which was the pre is a precursor or is it actually considered part of the ultimate Ultima series it's, you'd, it's you'd know. sometimes referred to as Ultima Zero yeah which is strange I mean there's definitely elements in there um, but it and I haven't played this much at all. And there, so it's recognizable when you get dropped into these dungeons. It's like, okay, um, this is familiar terrain. But uh, it's definitely clunkier, <laughs> uh, more amateur. And by amateur, you know, I mean for the love of it. There, you can see a lot of this, and even from this opening screen, you see a lot of what um, Richard Garriott, the creator of Agalabeth and Ultima, etc., uh, these um, uh, they there was this desire to turn over a lot of the role of the DM, all the like the logistical, uh, cumbersome uh, handling of rules, and just kind of like, oh, here's a thing that can do this for us. Uh, so here was uh, one of the first uh, attempts at this, and it, you know, it's, like I said, it's a little bit clumsy. Um, but uh, it's still beautiful, I think. Yeah, I, and I, we were talking just before we actually started the Twitch stream. Well, first of all, I'm Scott Bruner. I'm also an academic here. Uh, my field, I'm in the English department, uh, along with Chris, PhD student, um, studying ludic narratology. And uh, we were talking a little bit about Temple of Apshai, which is my favorite RPG of all time. And without getting into it, um, one of the things I loved about Temple of Apshai was, one of the things that Ultima got really famous for was all of the things that kind of created a world that you thought you were jumping into, right? Yeah. Um, which was the same thing. Temple of Apshai was this old RPG game that you would enter a room and you would say, you're in room 150, and you had to look in the manual to see what the description of that room was. If you got a treasure, it would say you have treasure 64, and then you would look it up. Um, I love a lot of these classic games because of how much the game relied on your imagination outside the actual digesis yeah. of the of the digesis in the right word because that'd be the narrative world but the actual the, the mechanical game that was actually presented on the screen so much was kind of fed in by your imagination yeah. um and these this this the calabeth screen here with this kind of wizard is he throwing a knife or i don't know if he's i don't know i've i've stared at this before and i've seen i've stared at this on my own time i I feel like it's so unbelievably evocative. Like it makes yeah. me want to play the game. Yeah. Um, and then later they would get the. Would, I think the artist for all the Ultima game, the later Ultima games, Dennis Lube, I think is his name. Okay. I need to look that up. Um, but you know the same thing. I, I I mean Ultima Four, which is how we actually started thinking about doing the stream. The picture on that of the guy in front of the water, you know, and there's not a single picture of what the game looks like on the <laughs> Ultima Four box, right? 
Um, and yet that game, I mean, I, I still pull that game aside and stare at it. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm digressing. But no, it's just... I think it's interesting how much of a Calabeth or how much of these early games relied on the creation of you to create the world based yeah. on things that were not part of the game. I mean, and compared to other games, uh, say like your take Atari games, for example, that relied on like cover art and comic uh, book, insert comic books or whatever, all these paratexts yeah. inside the box. Otherwise, you know, what the heck is Yars Revenge? What's yeah. it, what's it, what is Yars? And what, that came what with a comic book. Here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's Star Raiders over there. It has a really bad comic book in there. Um, but there are these things that uh, that helped us kind of envision right. what this world was. And and for by those standards, it's you know pretty sophisticated for what it's doing. It's one of the first... Not the first, but one of the first games that used three-dimensional um, mm -hmm. graphics. Uh, there, there were others, but um, again, this kind of married a bunch of things. Uh, let's see. Um, you talked about Richard Garriott, and I was going to, again, you know probably more than I do, but originally he was writing games with a teletype machine. Is that correct? I don't know that one. Um, if I... I read that somewhere. But, I mean, originally some of the games that he had... To, yeah, he did. Because he was writing them at school. I think his high yeah. school. He was trying to transcribe his home D&D &D games. Um, and if, if correct to be able to save them back then, he had to save... I, I have no idea how the technology was. There's actually technology before me, which I guess I suppose <laughs> is weird. Um, but I think to save them, he had it on some type of teletype paper, punch punch paper, or whatever okay. they were using back then. Um, obviously, Richard Garriott, so... So he, he comes figure. And he's from that whole NASA aeronautics background. Yeah. And so he had access to these things for uh, a while. And he was so accomplished uh, for, I mean, for that time. And as far as like computer programming, he, he convinced his parents, like, if I can complete a game by the end of summer, I'll get it. Okay. You, you can get, buy me a computer. He convinced his parents principal to let him out of classes or a class I, I'm not, no, to basically independent study yeah. and write what I think eventually becomes a Calabeth. So this is a this is home, this is a student project. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's impressive. You know, so there was a lot of this I think at some point he had done computer programming. He went off to a computer programming camp. And that's where he was introduced to D and D. Mm -hmm. Then he comes back mm -hmm. to school, and and this is what we have. But it it's interesting, you know. We were talking earlier about um, you know dissertation, what our projects, and like maybe we can mention that. Like this, and that's where where my interests lie is uh, more along the lines of Garriott was creating that community, that the group of friends that he had made at camp. And this was uh, hmm. his attempt at kind mm -hmm. of recreating that the community and that that sense of place that he had when playing these games. That's that's interesting to me. I I, I, that, I don't want to digress again, but that's interesting to me the, the sense of community when you think about Ultimate Games. Yeah. So one of the things that I find so interesting in Richard, and we'll get more into it. Obviously, we're going to be doing. I think a Calabeth uh, today, we'll probably do Ultima 1, 2, and 3, maybe just one day each, and then jump into Ultima 4, and I think that's probably the first time we'll spend multiple sessions doing mm -hmm. a, a game. Um, but his design sensibilities have always been to try to create such simulated worlds, uh, especially like, you know, he, he always, the games are always about, I always find it interesting, the, when I was a kid, you know, there were there were kind of there are two kind of camps for uh, role playing I think design right there's the wizardry bard's tale game mm -hmm. which were much more like war straight war game strategy games um, there wasn't much story there wasn't the idea of creating a huge entirely simulated world which even I, I don't I haven't played a cowboy so I'm, we'll see how it works here mm -hmm. but uh, I would even say in the first couple definitely Ultima three which I have played a little bit of you know you walk into stores you go visit the king you visit the seer. The idea of simulation worlds, and even Richard Garriott has a, you know, he has a post where he's like, this, this is what the ultimate RPG would be. And one of the things he mentions is that you would be able to interact with every item. And I know in mm -hmm. Ultima 7, that was the idea. You could interact with everything. You could cook things. You could have, you know, you could do whatever you wanted to do. You could craft a table if you wanted to. And that came as, as far as, from what I'm aware. It's, mm. it's interesting that he was always trying to digitally, instead of, I think, trying to recognize the differences between what you could do in a tabletop role-playing game 
it was like he was always trying to incorporate those things. I, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I've gone off on a page, but it's interesting the idea of community because all of his games, of course, are all single player games, right? Mm-hmm. Until Ultima Online, yeah. um, which was which was always the inevitable vision, right? Which is interesting. I mean, there was always that like in multiplayer games had existed prior to that. There was mm-hmm. like Maze War or something like that where you right. threw a bunch of people into a, a three dimensional space. Um, but he wasn't after that. He wanted, right. and even though a lot of those games, of course, feature that kind of that combat, there was that there was no multiplayer experience until Ultima Online. But I think, you know, maybe by the time <laughs> if we get to Ultima Online, we can find some way of getting on there. Um, <laughs> you can. I actually got it running about three months ago. No kidding. Yeah, and there's people that run. I, am I allowed to say this? Because I, well, I don't know if they're official servers, but they're people that run classic servers like they do for World of Warcraft. Okay. Um, I'm Ultima Online, of course, is still running, but in a much more accessible client than it was when it came out when okay. uh, I was playing it back in the day. Yeah, I uh, I mean, we'll get our way up there, but... So, I guess the the approach of this stream is uh, we're going... We're starting with the Calabeth. I'm not sure. We'll probably jump around a little bit. I mean, we haven't gotten that far, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about Bard, Bard's Tale, uh, Wizardry, which is all... Uh, pretty exciting um oh my goodness i was playing bard's tale on the phone the other day just and it just it's amazing how uh quickly it just brings you back to to childhood so and it's not even nostalgia it's there's a feeling to it that uh i think it's precisely what i'm trying to figure out with this project Mm -hmm. it's like what how do we where is this feeling coming from it's more than nostalgia because even with something like a calabeth that I, i i there's no I mean, I've never played it when I was a, when I was younger. Yeah. So, but there's still this feel like there's between the the way it looks and the way that some of these games were created. Um, for Bard's Tale, it's pretty simple. It starts in a bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. We get to, well get to Bard's Tale. If you can kill you. It's like it's it's an adventure just to get to the adventure shop <laughs> in Bard's Tale. You can actually get your entire party. You can spend like. You know, depending on how much time you spend in character creation, you literally can be like, oh, I'm ready to go. And then you have to walk down the street of the town of Scarabray mm-hmm. that is overrun by monsters and easily get killed. Um, I love this. I, I'm wondering, as we play a Calabeth and the Ultima games, um, Ultima 4, there's a lot of combat in Ultima 4. There's mm-hmm. a lot of combat in these old games that you don't have, I think, in a modern game. Um, I think so much because I think that's where they thought so much the gameplay needed to exist, right? That's where the strategy in the war game... Uh, you know, I was playing Ultima 4 about a year ago, and I remember just trying to walk between the two towns. Oh, it became yeah. an exercise in monotony. And, but the, uh, I, and I don't know how the combat works in this game. What we do that we... Well, we'll see. But uh, right? Yeah, we should probably use it. So this was... Um, so this came out, at, according to Matt Barton here, I've got his book just so I can refer to it. They don't know when this game was officially released, either 1979 or 1980. Uh, I guess it was originally released by Richard Garriott. Um, and then he eventually had a partnership before California Pacific to release the game. And I'm sure this is probably one of the... I, he sold this in plastic bags um, to computer stores, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I can tell the stream is already going to have a lot of digressions, so... <laughs> Whatever, um, but what the th- I was looking up today, uh, just curious, because uh, you find a lot of these like nice things on eBay, right? <laughs> and just happened across this guy's website, who his job is to, or his blog is to track down uh, fake copies of this game. I mean, I'm sure there are other games, but there was this uh, large amount of real estate devoted to. Uh, tracking down people who were selling uh, pirated copies of the Calabeth or fake copies. And he had this kind of breakdown of what, you know, there were so many copies of this, and he had a picture, you know, he had pictures of the legitimate, you know, like Gary had pre- that owned, and there were no other copies of this in existence. There might be one at, at U, U of T, but nowhere else. So if it's got one screen sticker on the corner, you know. <laughs> But always that glorious paper bag, the right, the plastic yeah, bag. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I've got like a, a copy of the manual because, as we we're saying, the the, I mean, in PDF. Oh, that's form. awesome. But um, you know, this uh, we haven't. I didn't even look at it before I came down here. We haven't mentioned uh, good old games, but this copy is uh, the version that's offered through uh, GOG.com. Um, 
I don't know, they, I think by most accounts, they've been doing the best work in preserving a lot of these older games. Uh, it is interesting to see the gaps. Like, I think Wizardry 8 is on there, but the original Wizardry is not. That's correct. Um, all the Ultimo games are on there, I think. But anyway, so here we go. <laughs> so my understanding is this: we are going to pick a lucky number, and I. So two things that I, I'm referring to stuff that I read before we jumped on here. But obviously, Matt Barton's Dungeons and Desktop, but Jimmy Maher is the Digital Antiquarium website, which is probably my favorite website on the internet. Um, did a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of history on how this game was created, and so that's why I'm getting this information. But my understanding is that we pick a lucky number here, and that is the random that is the seed for the random number generator that the game uses throughout the entire game, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because were even at that time there were certainly other ways to do it, but uh, depending if you pick the lucky number, then I guess a lot of the same roles are going to be exactly identical every time you play, which is kind of really interesting. Um, why would Richard Garriott provide us with the ability to choose the seed of the random number generator? I have no idea. Well, maybe, I mean, uh, we very might well have two different separate streams on this game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it, it's interesting because here, I mean, if you think about, and this is just conjecture, but there's, here's an attempt, and it, at the time, computers were not visual. They were pretty archaic, um, mystical machines that uh, the user really had no idea what was going on. And so what if you are a player and, you know, you're used to the face-to-face -face experience with a, with a dungeon mm -hmm. master, mm -hmm. What is this a way to alleviate that kind of skepticism and uh, <laughs> <laughs> towards this this uh, uh, invisible DM? We have knocked over the DM screen to enter our lucky number. Well, yeah, I mean this is so. Uh, any ideas? Um, unfortunately, we're never going to get past the lucky number screen. How about seven? All right. How about seven? All right. Now, is that level of play? Do we think that that's difficulty? Let's see. The lo okay, so according to the manual, the lucky number, this is a seed for the random number generator. Each time you use the same number, the game setup is the same as the first time. Interesting. I can't believe, I'm surprised that was in the manual. I felt... Smart for knowing that. Yeah, well, same map, same dungeon, same <laughs> player, and same monsters. So you basically have... Well, I wonder... I mean, I just assumed that it was 1 through 10. Right. Uh, level of play. This number is directly related to the monster strength. Level of play 10 creates monsters that are 10 times harder to destroy as le level of play 1. So this will be your um, Akalabeth version of... Punish me in Doom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like 10 would be the nightmare level. We've gone with 7. We'll be fine. So this, I mean, for for me, this is where it starts hitting home. I mean, if you've ever played a tabletop role-playing game, I mean, this is where it starts looking familiar. Um, I'm always amazed how it's been. So Dungeons & Dragons, oh, jeez, I should know. Is that Dungeons and Dragons 1974, 90, anyway, um, I guess Dungeons and Dragons Zero, I think it was 1974, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's amazing how long Dungeons and Dragons has been around, and we still stick uh, um, to the same strength, dexterity, intelligence, constitution, yep. wisdom, charisma that Gygax. Um, so here we've got strength, dexterity, stamina, wisdom, uh, we're missing intelligence and charisma, but everything else is straight out of your Dungeons and Dragons player's yeah. handbook, right? I mean... How often did you use the word dexterity after you discovered what it meant? <laughs> yeah. It's like my vocabulary word for like fifth or sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> How many kids misunderstood what charisma actually was? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, those things, yeah, those things are like cultural touchstones. Too. Well, I wonder if that's also why Subculture. charisma was always a low, the lowest. <laughs> like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, um, what happens if you say no? No, we shall not play with these qualities. We'll okay. rule. Because if you're saying the same player. Yeah. Well, we don't want to have dexterity of seven. That doesn't look too bad. So this one doesn't give you... Interestingly, there's uh, there's no enter. Like, I can't hit return if I hit N. Mm -hmm. So I assume if I hit Y, we're stuck with this. 
And this is running through DOS boxes. That's correct. So this is yep. GOG's version of DOS box. Yeah. Uh, not too bad. Uh, in my brief playthrough earlier, I ran out of gold really fast. Didn't say no. I mean, oh, was he going to say stuck at twelve for gold? Oh, I hope not. That's those are pretty good numbers, though. We had twenty twos before. I'm trying to, I want to see if the gold. Oh. Low hit points based on stamina. Not very wise. Well, I'm sure we're going to get killed anyway, so. Yeah. Whenever. Oh, yeah? Let's do it. <laughs> so those are, so we have a binary choice here. I'm actually glad that I haven't played, that I didn't play this before. This is actually more fun. Um... Mm -hmm. I think we kind of have to be a fighter. I mean, 16 wisdom seems a little low. Yeah, and this is kind of an interesting take. And, like, I, I don't know how... I mean, I guess we're going to be referring to D&D in those early games quite a bit. Um, but there was... I'm sure there were multiple approaches, but there was always that, do you build your character off the roles, or do you have these... Uh, or vice versa, like, oh, I want a fighter and you know so i'm gonna roll and yeah 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 allocate the stats accordingly well i i'm i am not the typical i'm not the typical dungeon i i still play dungeon dragons i still love it um i run a long running first edition um game actually but um i never i always made i always loved characters that uh that are limited in some way i always think it's more interesting mm. to have kind of drawbacks i was always yeah. because i was interested in stories i never had a problem with my characters dying um but yeah, I, how much of a role player can he be? I think he can be. I mean, we could sit here all day and hit no, 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 no until we can get the closest to the maximum stats that we can have. Um, your choice is fighter or mage is binary. It's missing, of course, what most folks think in terms of the, the trinity. If there's really just three classes in a role-playing game, it's fighter, mage, thief, right? So you have... Yeah. You're, we're doing, I guess, wizards and warriors here. Uh, you have one of the two choices between the two. Yeah, which is kind of a strange limit, but again, this is why we're. I mean, that's why it's it. It is early. Like this is one of those like clumsy qualities that I was talking about before. Get that tinker out. All right, fighter or mage? Fighter, I'm thinking. I, I think we have to do fighter. Huh. All right. So this is always. Um, I ended up buying like four axes last time. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what I was doing here. Oh, I like that the magic amulet. So, yeah. Mm, excuse me. I think, it, yeah. Mm. Now, can we... So I don't even know how. Are we going to be able to come back to this store later? I don't know. But I am going to try... Bear with me. Yeah, that's brilliant. So even if you can't, people can't read it, they at least know what the hell I'm staring at here. But you, I, I do want to uh, pause at this. I mean, I'm look, you know, these, the illustrations in this book obviously kind of look like, you know, maybe one of Richard Garriott's friends did it. At the same time, I, I have to say, they bear such an, um, the sensibilities that I'm seeing in this are of what Dungeons and Dragons was doing—a much darker kind of 1970s style pulp uh, fantasy look. And I think, in some ways, Richard Garriott goes away from that. I think you can easily see the Dungeons and Dragons roots here yeah. in just the imagery as well, right? These, these look like dark. I, well, the, the name of the game is a Calabeth World of Doom. Um, hey, you, we didn't see. I feel like I've seen a title screen. Maybe we, we flipped by it that says Enter Calabeth World of Doom and it's got like a crazy wizard on it. Yeah, but there's... I haven't seen this. If it's in this version, I haven't seen it yeah. yet. But there are like the Commodore 64 versions. And I know what you're talking about. There's this... Um, uh, maybe we can actually bring it up. So this is... I read was reading this article the other day about um, and this is more about uh, curation of images but this is kind of a meta view the author uses this term meta view as this and this is the eve of 
like Google Maps and everything and how collaborative place making happens through imagery so um, I'm trying to think of And it does become kind of like this. There you go. Can... Yeah, that's what I was looking for. I think this is, I, if there's anything, um, I didn't play a lot of Ultima as a kid. Um, I played a lot of Ultima 4 when it came out. But I, I'm just amazed at, um, even looking at a Calabeth and even looking at the manual with the pictures, I, the, I, I like that it begins with the preface, the annals of a Calabeth. The world building that I think Richard Garriott's kind of doing, um, in a meta context, I think is kind of, kind of fascinating, uh, and it works really well for Ultima. This is on your timeline. Yeah, that was the. That obviously that's that's <laughs> definitely Apple II graphics, right? And it just, I love the, just the way the the, the syntax. <laughs> uh, they're just so that all the trappings of. Uh, we are situated that we are a trespasser. We are situated yeah. as a transgressor in the land of Akalabeth. Now, Akalabeth is a reference to uh, Lord of the Rings, if I'm not mistaken. Do you know that? I had no idea. If it is, um, nothing but uh, props to Richard Garriott for now. If you type in Akalabeth, the first thing it's going to go to is this game. It was a reference to. Well, I'll have to look up that later. All right, should we buy some items? So yeah, um, this is where I could never figure out what the controls, and this is, you know, I think maybe next time, even printing out a copy of this and bringing it, it will be. A little bit easier, at least to have, because this is really hard to read. A Calabeth is the fourth part of the Silmarillion, as edited by Christopher Tolkien. It is a relatively short summary of the Numenor narrative of J.R.R. Tolkien's Legendarium. Numenor is the name of the island that is cataclysmically destroyed in Tolkien's variant of the Atlantis legend. When was the Silmarillion published? Uh, 1977 was edited okay. by his son Christopher. So, um... Yeah, the other thing, I, I, Jimmy Maher brings this up a lot. Um, again, another digression. But, you know, all of the things, one of the things that Jimmy Maher talks about in Digital Land Aquarium about that, that Richard Garrett does throughout the Ultimate series is he begins to bring in a lot of the popular fictions that he's kind of experiencing. Mm -hmm. He talks about Richard Garriott was kind of obsessed by the, the movie Time Bandits, which is, by the way, a movie that deserves to be obsessed about. <laughs> um, but the, the gates, you know, the, the gates at the the kind of dwarven time travelers are running into mm -hmm. um that's what inspired the moon gates in yeah. ultima 4 that's, i never even put those two together but <laughs> time bandits uh, terry gilliam's putting out a new one soon i heard um, <laughs> i liked zero theorem but i can't say his recent output is not as good as a lot of the old stuff i've well, taught i taught yeah. time bandits before which is uh, it's such a great film really yeah my uh, existentialist class I did all three of the Terry Gilliam's uh, uh, Time Bandits Brazil and Adventures of Baron Munchausen oh wow <laughs> this is an existentialist Exist class? it was playful existentialism okay at any rate alright so I, I would go with axes I you know it's a first level character I always tend to uh, armor up early characters and the idea that we're going to survive better so I'm thinking that the way this works is You've got your stats. You've got your weapons. It shows you this is your inventory off on the upper right-hand corner. It says price, but there's nothing here that tells you how to to buy. And so 
what it seemed to work was actually typing in the first letter. So if I type in axe, which item shall you buy? And axe didn't work, but if I type in food, oh, wait a second. Maybe I'm. You have to type, do you have to type one? No. That's what I thought. Um, if you quit, you'll leave. So how the hell? So you tried F? What happens if you type in food? Oh, so you bought a shield. I bought a shield, and that was that was S. Okay, maybe I have to have caps on. Oh, you have to. It's shift whatever letter. So it is. So it's shift. I got an X. I got a shield. Definitely food, because you run out of that. Okay, so. I got 10 food. Um, as I mentioned, I died last time of starvation, so I'm going to get two. Now I'm down to nine gold, and I have. Food. I got axe and shield. Uh, nothing in the way of armor. I could get a bow and arrows. Uh, or I could save. <laughs> How much money? We got nine left. Um, I've been told that the magic game is extremely overpowered, but we don't have 15 gold, so uh, we won't do that. I would. Why not pick up a. How much is a bow and arrow? Oh, three, three, yeah. Yeah, we need that. It does f one to four points of damage. A shield does one point of damage. I think that's interesting. <laughs> well, but it, I, I guess if it, it makes sense if you're if you're hitting a shield, you're gonna you're gonna feel it, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the shield bash feet uh, thirty years before D and D three point five. Uh, so we've got the only thing we don't have is a rapier, which you know whatever. That's an odd, Oops. odd uh, uh, item to have in there. Maybe that's if you had higher dexterity, but we've got that. Um, anyway, should we head on in? Sounds good. Bye. Huh. So, yeah, this was the... Um, this is about where I stopped because this looked so foreign and abstract to me I had no idea what I was looking at and apparently this is a I think it's a map of the town so if, I can't really see Do you know what language he was using to write this game? I have no idea. I'm assuming it wasn't basic. But, I don't know. I have no idea. So, we're in... It's showing that, in, according to this map legend, to the south of us are mountains. We are currently in a town, and that's where we bought the equipment. So the, stra the strange little, so what we're seeing here is the strange little, I don't know what shape that would be called, the little four squares around us, where yeah. we have a little plus middle, but that is a town. <laughs> it's Purina. How could, I, how could <laughs> I not understand that? A castle looks like a square with an X through it, mm -hmm. and those are mounts. Uh, so the weird squiggle lines right below us are mountains. Non-passable, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and the dungeons are going to be an X. So, 
I guess the next thing is so as far as commands go we use the return key to move north arrows left and right move south is the slash so let's see how that tra translates into <laughs> well I, we th there's the castle <laughs> so this is uh... okay so I did go north so it, so thankfully <clears throat> this version has a little bit more intuitive control setting and our food is going down as we walk around is that correct yes yeah so again that's uh, I mean it seems in, like that's a lot to go down with one so I'm gonna buy more food <laughs> since I did. Um, but it is kind of interesting you, you, it was one of those and this is the, the I mean, you've DM'd. Mm -hmm. I've never DM'd before. Okay. Um, I hate to say it. But this was one of those things that, as a player, uh, when food and weight and a lot of those more uh, first edition, mm -hmm. uh, those are the things we never paid attention to. Weight, if we were feeling like, hey, let's give it a try, and then we would like drop it after one session. Yeah, I don't... It's, it's funny you mention that. Now, in my games, I do run encumbrance rules uh, fairly strictly, but, you know... Most of the games I run now are on roll twenty. Um, oh, interesting. So uh, the 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 character sheets of roll twenty is made from first edition, kind of keep track of that all for you, so you oh, don't have to worry about the rules. Um, do they use Thacko and everything too? Yeah, wow. yeah. It's actually the way it works on roll twenty is actually really nice, um, and you know you can use as much or as little kind of input as you want. But that I mean, that might you know we're talking kind of about the micromanagement of things, um, and I think food is a concern in the Ultima games. At least through Ultima 4, I don't know. I mean, I know in Ultima 7 you can cook your own foods, mm -hmm. so I'm assuming there must have been a mechanic as well. Um, again, I feel like there was one design philosophy that Richard Garriott was always kind of going in a different direction. There's no food in Bard's Tale or Wizardry, right? It's basically, if there's, there's micromanagement strategies absolutely in those games, but they're almost always about combat. Yeah. Here we're actually micromanaging. Again, it's, it's, he's, he's building this world simulation. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it, it adds a weird mechanic. It adds a time to mechanic. Well, it's not a time mechanic because we can sit here and we won't lose any food until we actually move, right? But it does limit the amount of moves that we can make yeah. before we have to go and get back. And it was... I, I remember playing Ultima 4 recently and I was just... I, you know, I bought as absolutely much food as I possibly could because I just mm -hmm. didn't want to worry about it, right? Yeah. It, it does become this... You want it to be negligible and not <clears throat> not have to think about it. But um, it, even, to carry, even to carry 32... Portions of food, I think, right. would be. <laughs> why do it? I mean, it's an interesting question as to why to do it, too. Because, I mean, if you want to micromanage um, a simulation of what it would be like to, to walk through the woods, which, you know, to, to camp, there's so many things you could micromanage, you know. Mm -hmm. You could micromanage, um, you know, what about water or, you know, how are you going to sleep? But it's food that we have to think about, maybe because it's a diminishable resource. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's diminishable, and it does kind of introduce that economy uh, that's a little bit more... Uh, you know, it gives you something to spend your money on, just by uh, instead of other yeah. items. Like if I want to actually explore this world, I have to invest in sustenance. So we we have an early a Calibethian uh, critique of capitalism, <laughs> which is that the world is only open up to you as long as you continue to kill things to yep. get the money that you need. Exactly. Um, so I don't know if it's a critique or maybe even a reinforcement. <laughs> well, it's certainly cer certainly training young kids to understand. A little of both, perhaps. You're going to need a lunch before you can go out into the world. So, I mean, it's a pretty small arena. I mean, I'm o I can only go a few spaces each direction. There is a... Wait, so is that a town or a castle? I believe... Let's see. That Again, is most, a... Um, most of my old... A tree? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <That's a> tree. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> how have you walked into a tree? Uh, the castle has an X in the middle. All right. You're, and you're, then the dungeon is an X. Yeah. So I mean, even I mean, now, should we be map? I mean, I'm, I'm not not. I, I don't mean now, but I mean, should a player be mapping this? Let's try. 
was that the intent? Certainly Bard's Tale and Wizardry games, of course, you had to play them with a yeah. thing of graph paper next to you. And I know the dungeons in the later Ultimas, again, are just like the Bard's Tale and Wizardry's, where it has that first yeah. prism perspective, so you had to kind of bring a map with you as well. Um, am, am I remembering wrong that Ultima had maps? Or did, that you, or did I just happen to have a copy? Not, not that I remember. It didn't come with it. No. I mean, you get the cloth map of the world. Whoa. Oh. So these are trees. So we've got this. Oh, here's a little passage. See, I'm already running so little food. Oh, but here's another town. Now is the world procedurally generated? Or is it a static map? It looks, I'm assuming it's based on that, that first number. Because if the dungeons and every and right, the monsters right, right, are right, all... Right. So I'm going to enter. So we're already down to seven food. My goodness. And this is just to get to the next town. Wait, wait a second. So you can... You're in the middle of nowhere, but we were out allowed to buy more food? Oh, I, I found a town. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's all right. There you go. Yeah, so through this mountain passage. And this is a new town. Yeah. I know it came up through here. Um, what do you say if I... See, we have to get... See, now here's the point where it's like, well, now I've, I've got to find a dungeon at some point. Right. Because I've got nothing. Well, I'm curious about the castle. I mean, the only reason I'm so worried about the... Concerned oh. about the castle. There's a dungeon. So... How would you like to take over? No, I'm. You're fine. No, well, yeah, yeah, I can definitely take over if you want. Do you want to switch spots? Oh. Are we ready? Do we need to go to the castle? For, I feel like. And I'll see now. Now I'm thinking that mapping this wasn't such a not mapping this wasn't yeah. a good idea because <laughs> well, there's a town. I'm trying to. I, there's another town. So there seem to be a lot of towns. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we mourn the passing of the peasant and his computer. We mourn the passing of the peasant and his computer to invoke a miracle of resurrection. I'm not sure that sentence may need an editor. <laughs> mourn the passing of the peasant. Well, let's keep the same lucky number. That way we know that we have some general idea where everything is. I'm going to bring it down to five. Wisdom 24. Dexterity 24. Yeah, let's go with this. I said yes. No. Sure. 18 now. Let's be old. No. No. <laughs> sure. I need to fight her again. So yeah, again. Shield. How much was the bow now? Three. Axe is one to five. I'm gonna find out. We got sixty food. We're good. I would hope so, man. <laughs> All right. So how do I leave? Uh, sh Q should be Q. All right. That's weird. The quit actually takes you to the world. So he oh look. That's so a we have a new map. world. I did I not say maybe because I said five is the level of play. This ad. Oh yeah. Maybe. And the, but the number was the same, right? The seed number was the same seven. Oh, you, oh, you see, we, oh, 
I went downstairs to try to find graph paper this morning and I couldn't find any. Sorry. Well, let's do this. Oh, love it. <laughs> <laughs> I grab them, my water bottle. I mean, pretty pretty straightforward. Um. <coughs> so now we've entered was a little bit more. I mean, these graphics look exactly the same as the first wizardry uh, proving grounds yeah. matter overload, right? <sighs> so that's weird. Is that door remaining open? <coughs> Oops. So I start here, I move down the hallway. I'm already at food 22, so we've already gone halfway through the food. Does that say 21.8 food? Yeah, so oh, so it's going down by... Oh, In the dungeon. Well, yeah. That was easy. I'm good at this game. I found a chest already. One pieces of eight and a shield. I get the f oh, there you go. All right, here we go. What am I going to be now if the fans out? I hit A, attack which weapon? Oh, not the shield. I'll try the axe. I'm going to throw Swing. You're being attacked 10 by a giant rat. I missed. Hit. Nice. His hit points are down to four. He's gone. Where the hell did he go? Alright, so we went down in that dungeon, and just by going into a dungeon, we gained three hit points. We gained three? That is correct. Do we go up a level? I don't believe there are levels in this game. Um, I just came back in the same dungeon, and it's different. Is that the entire dungeon? But was that the same ladder that you went down in? Okay, I gained zero hit points. I didn't spend enough time. Oh, maybe, I wonder if it's like resting or... I mean, this is, this is, this, this is like a rogue-like at this point. Hmm. Um... See what happens. I'm gonna give you exactly what we did the first time. Yes. Fighter. Do the rapier. No shield this time. That's different as well. Unless it's place, is it placing us at a different? Oh, placing us at a different town each time. Maybe because um, it's pretty easy to get to that dungeon. So, all right. So we know this. Um, kind of playing games like we did as a as I did as a kid, which is just go fight stuff and go back and not worry about the story or anything else. Well, there really isn't much of a story at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, All right, here we go. Oh, I don't have an axe. 
So it's not telling you what you have, right? Mm -mm. No. All right, I killed a giant rat, and I received four pieces of eight. Uh, I like the gold being given to us in pirate terms. <laughs> I, I don't know what pieces of actually the reference to is a reference. So I'm going to quickly get lost in here. That's okay. I right, see. Even when with the other aspect of the food, is it does prompt you to map and take account of where you're at, <laughs> so you yeah. don't get lost. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I mean, it's an. It is a. This is an interest. I mean, it, I. I can't stop thinking about this as a little bit of a roguelike. So is it exit? So, from going to that dungeon, I've gained two hit points. I gained a little bit of gold, and then we go back here. That's a tree. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to not pretend that I didn't just try to enter a tree. And then I'll, I mean, it's, what are we going to do? We're going to buy food, 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 food. Do we have any idea of why we're doing this? Why we're searching through dungeons? Is it's this game is simply about gathering experience? Well, if you're or just exploring, I don't want to go into a dungeon without now that here's a town. I mean, if it's. And this isn't the same dungeon. Mm -hmm. Whoa! A trap. We're falling to level two. I'm being attacked by a skeleton. That's a terrific graphics. I think somewhere on the on the front page there's a exclamation of eight unique monsters. <laughs> <laughs> What the heck is this thing? It's a thief. Oh, and they take your stuff, I think. How are you on gold? Yeah, I don't know. That's an S. Isn't it S statistics? A trap. Now I'm on level three. All right. Whoops. Whoa. Not owned. He's, did he steal it? What? What is? He, that's your bow and arrows. I thought. He. Did he change? Do you see this this little thing that he's got in his chest? Yeah, it like popped up when he stole your bow and arrows. A thief stole a shield. A thief stole a food. Attack hands. Get these hands. I hit. He's just bleeding me dry. I'm going to take you out with my hands. We have nine hit points left. I want my stuff back. This is kind of a cool mechanic, though. I like this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm impressed by any thief that is able to steal from you as you're actually battling him. With one hit point left. Make it count. Yes! Nice. Is that my stuff? I thought so. It's a, oh. Now it's a snake. <laughs> I 
It's your stuff. No, it's a viper. <laughs> <laughs> so we take the thief out, and unless it was a uh, unless it was somewhere beyond us, we were not able to get our stuff back. Well, I wonder if the thing that icon was something behind him. If that viper was just waiting, waiting his turn. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because we don't know. We still don't know whether I could have picked up my stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like the idea that he's stealing from you and then throwing it behind him. <laughs> Not sure how you, he's attacking us and also able to steal the food that we have in our pockets, which is kind of interesting. So I can't get away from the fact that this feels like such a roguelike, uh, but maybe that's the level of difficulty. Now, should we try? Let's see. Let's try a wizard, right? Yeah, I was going to say, I wonder if. So I wonder if the rapier is the mages. Well, I was using it f fine with the, the last character. Or maybe this doesn't follow that that formula. Well, I tried to buy a rapier and says, I'm sorry, mages can't use that. Oh. So if I can't... So now I'm curious, which is I have the same options to buy the same equipment that I had as the fighter, but I can't use some of these items. Then what does the mage... What can the mage do? Now, should we buy the magic amulet? Well, that'll, that's all your gold. <laughs> <laughs> I was just noticing that, like, wow. Uh, the magic amulet is... Uh, so awesome. this is going to be a quick game, but maybe we can use the magic amulet as soon as we step outside. There's two towns back to the St. Paul and Minneapolis. There we go. <laughs> all right, you're up. Do you want to give it a try? Uh, sure. You'd think that the whoever runs the shop should have mentioned. All right, I'm gonna try a different number this time. What do you think? Oh, that's our, yeah, that's all right. I'll do, I'll do three. I keep trying to bring up. A, all right, one thing I've learned from the stream is I think next week I want to have the manual on hand. It's it's, it's definitely much more. Yeah, it's easier to read than this. Uh, so I'm going to go for a mage this time. Wisdom's good, but I don't like that gold. But, you know, we are talking a little bit about how these games kind of make you feel a little bit like... it. Even despite the... Uh, I shouldn't say the... I'm going to say primitiveness, but that's not a good term to use. Despite the fact that the graphics are obviously old, um, everything is kind of... I mean, a tree is represented by a block. I still am finding myself wanting to go downstairs and, like, get out the graph paper and, like, get into this. Oh, yeah. You know? Um, which I think our idea was to kind of do more of that when we get to the games that are a little bit more sophisticated around the Ultima Four time. But at the same time, there's still something that's, like, compelling me um, to do the, the management that Richard Garriott is asking us to do here. Well, sure. I mean, if you... Ch if you even, like, how we're approaching it now, it seems like we're... Not cheating's not the word, but definitely not experiencing it the same way mm -hmm. as we would have. What, gosh, forty years ago? Right. <laughs> um. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, it's the game is a. It almost seems as though like we're we look at games now, and that's. That's it, right? We're, our focus is on what's going on on the screen. Right. And it, you briefly mentioned it before, where there's more going on off screen. Yeah. And I think you see just how important all that extra diegetic stuff was to mm -hmm. this, to these types of games. The manuals and the, um, the graph paper and... Um, Everything that you were doing, the game was m all minor. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a, a just a window yeah, yeah. into something that uh, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I think you know the, the the majority of I think what's I mean in the same I this you know this gets into the larger question of you know where does the realization of a narrative actually take place? But when we're talking about signifiers and representatives like this, because the symbols are so non. 
realistic, I guess, yeah. that most of the realization, of course, has to happen in your head. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I think there's something to be said, too, for... So we're five years removed from, you know, D&D Zero, and even at D&D, you know, the first edition, the Zero edition is they usually call it of Dungeons and Dragons. So we're... This, is, this game is coming out absolutely um, in 79, right in the moment where people were playing a ton of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Which probably it's just... Well, I, I would say D&D hits its peak right after the... The Satan, the Satan scares of D&D, which I think comes out in 8081 with the James Dallas Egbert, but this is still within this wheelhouse of Dungeons & Dragons as a completely new revolutionary form of gameplay, right? Mm-hmm. So this game and mimicking those things, I would think, I mean, you know, obviously this is the first thing that's going to launch Richard Garriott to a career that's going to allow him to go into space with the, the money that he makes. Um, but you can see, you know, I, I can understand people being like, my God, I can I can play Dungeons & Dragons on my computer. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that, you know, we talk about how it's almost a cultural touchstone now to read Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, Wisdom, Charisma. But when this game came out, it, you know, it would, those phrases are only going to be understood by people who are playing D&D. And they're yeah. probably so excited to see them, you know. Um, the same way that somebody gets excited about reading Ready Player One if they know all the references. As soon as you bring this up, if you're a D&D player, you're so excited to play yeah. this game, right? Um, and so you can even get away with a, a very, oh, this pa- this manual is seven pages. Yeah, you know, and I'm not sure if that is how close this is to the original. Mm-hmm. But even if this were a third or fourth edition of those instructions, yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> right. I can't imagine they shrank them. So that's it, it's saying a lot about how much the you know Garriott is taking for granted that his audience knows. What's going on? Well, that's see, and you know, we're talking. You know, I talked about the like the D and D reference. People would be so excited. Of course, I mean, there's a huge Venn diagram overlap between the people who are playing D and D and the people who are the original home computer enthusiasts. So yeah. while D and D is exploding, PCs aren't exploding yet, right? Yeah. So the people that are going to own these things are going to be hobbyists. Uh, I mean, I remember, I do have a copy of Wizardry One at my house, and and oh, wow. the back of it, there's a you know a review from Computer Gaming. I mean, the, the, the quotation, you know, the back-of-the-box quotations you have from these games are so ridiculous for, for us to read them now. But, like, one of them is, like, Wizardry is not a game. It is an actual world built on your computer. Someone says, you know, I didn't think the PC was capable of doing something as sophisticated as creating the world of Wizardry. Um, you know, I mean... So you've got two people that are going to be excited about something like that. Come mm-hmm. up. I think people that are going to see the Dungeons & Dragons being kind of realized on a computer, but you also have the same people that are that are excited because the computer can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because what what was this a sub again? This is a substitute for the DM, because right? When, when yeah. we we don't always have access to those groups, right? And to those <laughs> community of players that we were we were fond of, and so this, if you are at home, you know, and you're not alone and not doing, you know, not necessarily alone, um, but uh, the this was the substitute. You know, I can have a similar experience that that solo Mm -hmm. experience right and this will handle all of those or some of the nuts and bolts it's up to me to handle like the graphing and um again and goes back to that interesting question of food like why you know there's an interesting if we're maybe this is a, a, a critical point that gary didn't trust the player enough to handle things like food mm-hmm um (laughs) <laughs> there are certain things like that is significant. Like why keep that in there? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th- I think I mean we, we. I think it's fascinating to go through these ultimates because I think it's you're getting an incredible insight. I wonder what Richard Garriott was like as a dungeon master because his all of his mm. again we're using not you know we haven't gotten to the ultimate four games but th- it's simulationist right it's yeah. it's he th- that's his idea and so you can see all of these. Um, I mean, the food is the first thing that comes through. The fact that you're moving through, the fact that he he can't place a dungeon without context. Yeah. You know, wizardry and bard's tale have no problems doing it. Wizardry does it by just saying you drop into the dungeon. You know, all of the there is a town in wizardry, right? There's a town above ground because uh, you go to Boltax Trading Post and Gilgamesh's Tavern, but it's only done in menus. There's mm-hmm. no graphical interface. The game begins when you actually enter the dungeon, right? Here. Part of the game is actually being played before you enter the dungeon. Part of the game is managing these resources because you don't have much to manage in this game. Mm-hmm. You just have the food, um, but it's still part of the game. Yeah. Um, Bard's Tale, of course, solves it by having, you know, it's, it's similar to wizardry, but the the town becomes a dungeon itself, mm-hmm. right? So it's still a town, but like I said, you could actually die on your way to the dungeon. Yeah. And that happens to, I think, more than 50% <laughs> of the people play Bard's Tale. Um, 
but the gameplay itself I think is still actually fairly compelling I like I said I still do fine I mean I, I I keep bringing up roguelike but that's what it feels like because mm-hmm. of this food and shit it's like how far can I get into these dungeons which of course is very different than dungeons and dragons yeah um well, unless you're playing Team of Horrors, I suppose. Yeah, but there's no. I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, this is a this is the child of a, a NASA astronaut. Right. Simulations were what computers were being used for. It's and it makes sense. And if you're looking for something to replace the DM, but it's it's ignoring the fact that the DM has a much more important role than managing graphs and stats. Uh, there's also I mean, it, maybe this does speak to. Uh, how Richard Garriott would be as a DM, Maybe yeah. he's someone you know who would be worried about encumbrance and you know um, the dice roll is king and you know the the, uh, the rule book is uh, a gospel and no fudging, right? Right. And so while this is probably a piece that you know he's he's playing with stats and he's playing with this as a as a simulation. We still don't know why we're here. Um, even the 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 uh, screen shot from the apple is <laughs> yeah okay a, a cave. I, <laughs> I have a blue cape. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean other dungeon crawl, like, you know um, Matt Barton's placing this like I said in the Bronze Age. The games that he's placing it around. Um, he mentions Temple of Apshai, which as I as I mentioned is my favorite game as well, mm. and that's the only game that has absolutely no no narrative purpose like you were literally exploring a dungeon but so much of course the early dungeons and dragons um you know the way we play Dungeons and dragons now is so completely different the whole idea of adventure paths and long form you know very much i think because of this is just me making throwing out a theory that a lot of it has to do with how the um um the demographics have changed for these games yeah. right i mean i think the folks that probably were playing that original computer enthusiasts and original D D enthusiasts would probably feel they really love the, ma- the, the math side of dungeons and dragons sure. and computers as well so again screens like this are probably like this is awesome um yeah well and you take a step back and re- um think about dungeons and dragons was a war gaming it was just kind of like a an add-on <laughs> a mm-hmm. mod of war games right and you know there was never you you knew because a lot of these war games were historically based you kind of you, you knew the scenario you knew there was no real narrative it was an event an occurrence mm-hmm. and you it, you know if you wanted narrative you just have to pick up your history book and figure that out right but and then Dungeons and Dragons comes along as this kind of request by Gygax's players and I'm not I don't recall what. Gygax's opinion of that was because by the time we get a hold of him, he's he's wealthy or <laughs> or at least was wealthy. Right. When we're inter- when you know when you interview him and yeah he's he's had a good life because of it so he's not hopefully not going to say too too much disparaging but the people who are even playing D anD D at this time were probably more aimed at stats. Yeah, I mean I, I think probably Richard Gary have to probably write in that demographic. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say, I wonder if we can try to find a castle, if there is, yeah. if there might be any type of narrative. Because I remember Ultima Four, the first thing you do is you walk out of Scarbray and you walk over. I think it's Scarbray is the first town you're in. Actually, I don't know that. Um, and or maybe it's Britannia. No, Britannia's the name of the world. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The first thing you do is walk to Castle Britannia because yeah. you have to find Richard to find Richard Garriott to find <laughs> Lord British, who is of course <laughs> Richard Garriott's you know in-game name, and then he gives you you know the absolute bare minimums of like what you're supposed to do um and i'm pretty sure that happens in ultimo one two and three as well mages can't use that did you go through all this already mages can't no i didn't oh you had enough gold to buy a magic amulet i did yeah i (laughs) i went through a couple times until i could uh my lord that kind of afford that well well i'm just gonna But I think there's something to be said too. These games, um, you know, how much do we overlay some type of plot on them when they remain so open to interpretation? I mean, it, 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 I'm a little bit older now, but when I, again, Temple of Apshai, which I should stop talking <laughs> about, 
has no story. I was mm-hmm. going to say one of the things that's really interesting to talk about how you can kind of fudge numbers. Mm-hmm. In Temple of Apshai, I played it off a cassette tape, a tape on a Commodore 64. There's no save system. You can't write to the cassette mm-hmm. tape, right? So uh, you were supposed to write down your stats. Uh, oh, and then yes. when you started a new game, it would say, you know, are you a new hero or have you returned? I've returned. And they say, okay, what was your strength? What was your intelligence? So if you wanted, you could completely game it or just write the you know maximums of all of that sure. um, as a ridiculously lawful good kid i never did that i always actually kept <laughs> i still mean i still have my character but you know temple of Abshai came with a small short story um mm-hmm. about brian hammerhand and you know he was like so it gives you a story like oh i could play this character you know it's not staying at your brian hammerhand but it's mm-hmm. giving you this 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 is the other character goes in temple of Abshai. so as a kid that's who i was i mean i spent all my time thinking that's who my character was and i created an entire um narrative reason for the character that the reason that my character was exploring the Temple of Apshai. And in many ways, I always assumed there was one there as a kid. As an adult, of course, I know that they were just kind of creating a dungeon. Yeah. Um, but how did, I mean, I don't know how does that change, you know. I, I'm interested in, in, in many ways, I'm interested in these narratives of Ultima because the narratives are plastered on top of something. Yeah. You know, they're narratives, and, and I, in some weird ways, they're almost generative. It's almost like they're, they're not... I think they're almost even more interesting because there isn't much thought coming from like a professional writer, right? Yeah. It's literally this guy who like oh, I have this game, maybe I need to have some reason. Um, I I think I'd mentioned this I mentioned this recently, but do, have you ever heard the the John Carmack quotation about stories in video games? Mm-mm. He's <laughs> excuse me. Interesting. I, <laughs> I was yeah. He always says stories in video games are like stories and porn like they're not necessary <laughs> right um you know that they're you know this is the designer of doom right yeah. and i loved doom in college i again created because the game gives you so little but i was yeah. always constantly i always even doom even as i'm playing that in college i always assumed that there was a story there when there wasn't anyway well I, yeah i mean i i've had this kind of um be in my bonnet i guess uh, this kind of difference between play and narrative that I mean this tired ludology narratology debate that we have in games mm-hmm. like, and I, I just always kind of ignored it up until now but now it does feel um, like things like this kind of bring that to light uh, where you know does it does story it, it puts things in a perspective those early like Janet Murray uh, um, yeah. Escalin and kind of debates on like going through uh, the first person second person third person series from uh, MIT the... Press uh, you know, they're god they're old now um, I vaguely remember them but they or heard the talk you know, but... well they have they, they have this they have one essay and mm-hmm. then below that they'll have like a, the response so you can yes. read this simultaneously and you're reading it, and man, they just get so like cantankerous. <laughs> and this is a heated debate, um, and it's interesting, like watching this, putting the, this a game like this into that perspective, because what, it, and it does bring to mind that other question of simulation versus game, right? That Stuart has brought up several mm-hmm. times, and I'm always like, okay, yeah, that's that's something I haven't thought about yet. Um, mm-hmm. This is a simulation, a world simulation, like you put it. Um, the, like the whole avatar, I mean, that's, and I think that's why Ultima 4, I guess we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but Ultima 4 is significant in my mind is because not only is it does it add that layer, but it's a very unique layer. Mm-hmm. It's kind of moralistic. Right. Um, you know, the game, uh, even if it is kind of sparse, and loosely applied, mm-hmm. you can't win the game unless you're a, a decent person. Right, right. And that's an interesting take. Um, and I seem to remember somewhere reading that Garriott was always kind of frustrated with the chronic combat that the, these games yeah. entail. The murder hobo, as they yeah. call it, in, in, in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, all your, you know, this game as well, you're just going out into the world with a sword and a reaper. Interesting that the only thing that you own that isn't a weapon is food. Yeah. Um, and again, again there's... And that's that's a substitute for time and space. Yeah. And like, these are the things that keep you grounded in not wandering, yeah. which I think is unfortunate. Right. Um, but... Because, I mean, that's one thing, another thing that Ultima does really well is that, I mean, if there's any... If there's 
a precursor to open world gaming in uh, com- for computers. Mm-hmm. I mean, those I, I, the the story was negligible again mm-hmm. in Ultima. It's like, oh yeah, I have to be compassionate here, don't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it it's interesting that you know we talk about Ultima Four, which which you know certainly was kind of revolutionary for what it was doing. Um, because it was, yeah, I mean, it gets away from, and, you know, I, I, I've always read that, you know, that it was a response to all of the, um, criticism that Richard Gary I was getting as new games are super uber violent. Again, I, this is a digression, but I will never forget. And I think the gentleman's name is Scott Adams. Uh, I used to run this, uh, I think it was like called Adams on games. Well, in like the Mac Macintosh magazine in the 90s or in the 80s and I will never forget him talking about the fantasy series which is talk about games that have been completely forgotten by time I'm um, not even sure I'm sure Matt Barton has something in here <clears throat> anyway well, this is a huge digression I'll try to keep this quick but um, <laughs> in that game it's a s- similar time period here um, it was made I think they were made by SSI the mm-hmm. same people who would then later so it was before the gold box games okay. and you would have a you'd have a party of adventures and when you would get into combat you had a little stick you had like little stick figures at the bottom of the screen and then the monsters would be above mm-hmm. you not different than my you would think in like a JRPG right mm-hmm. and they had different ranks you know so it was very similar to how Bard's Tale and Wizardry have different ranks of creatures but you actually saw them on the screen but when the creatures attacked you, you could get hurt in individual limbs. Right? Mm. You could your leg could be cut off. Your you know, I think if your head took damage, you could die. And that and in those ways, at least your character could. Um, but I will never forget the Scott Adams article about that, where he just talked about the the absolute level of graphic violence that were entering our games <laughs> at the time. He's like, I don't. Even, I remember him writing something. He's like, I don't even know what a mother would think to watch a child play this game, and to see, you know, it says blood is coming out of your leg, and how horrific that is. And here we are in an age where we have Grand Theft Auto, where you can do things that you know, not only you know, not only can you do things that are far worse than that necessarily, but of course they're represented extremely explicit mm-hmm. graphical terms. Yeah. Back then, I think your little hangman figure would lose an arm. <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I would. I, I know. I'd, I'd come off of the idea that you know. Ultima 4 was a response to that, right? Mm-hmm. Ultima 4 was a response to like, okay, I'm going to actually, instead of instead of continuing to reward just going out in violence, um, I guess I'm going to give you some. Of course, we're still three games removed from Ultima 4, but it, yeah. it's probably the one that we both spent more time on. Yeah, but that's, I, I mean, the, the combat is still here, though. Right. I mean, it does kind of, um, is that it? I mean, is as a response to the... Um, extreme violence of tabletop RPGs <laughs> at this time. Why have viol- Why have violence in there? Right. I mean, is it because violence is so easy to simulate? Well, conflict. Yeah. I mean, it's the easiest way to do conflict, straight up. Right. Yeah. The uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It's funny. I just had a player leave my first edition game um, because he was he was tired of the direction that it was going. So murder hobo. We. Um, <laughs> so as we were adjusting this recently, we had a conversation with my group. But Dungeons and Dragons narratively, and this is I think important to point out. Dungeons and Dragons came with for at least for the first few editions. Really well, they, they still do. They still come with an embedded world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can use the game system to apply to the second edition. I think was the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons where it allowed you to kind of branch off into different versions, you know. Yeah. Um, but first edition came with a world, right? It's one of the reasons why I like first edition more than the newer editions, because it comes from such a pulp fiction background. Um, Appendix N, which is what I wrote my master's thesis on. It, you, Appendix N was in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and it was a list of all the literary influences. And it's really interesting mm. because there's so many influences in Dungeons and Dragons that were not literary. It's so many films that influenced Gary Guy guys. Yet, end Appendix N is only books. Um, that Appendix still exists, even in Fifth Edition Dungeons and Dragons. There's a list of inspirations which they've updated with you know new works. Um, but those works were extremely violent. Um, mm. the, you know, um, Fafford and Grey Mouse are by Fritz Leiber. Um, I'm trying to think of the other... I'm Jack Vance. You know, the entire magic system Dungeons & Dragons was based on. All of these things are, were extremely violent works. Mm-hmm. Um, Fafford and Grey Mouser, which I read a lot of because they're a lot of my thesis. You know, they were, they were heroes, but these were not, you know... Um, they were completely compelled by money. Um, they were... I mean, they, they were power fantasy characters, yeah. you know, in many ways. Um, I can't remember what module it was, but I, I'm thinking... I 
remember DMing. That's the only one and only time I DMed. And I think <laughs> I must have been like 11 Third. or 12 years old. And then my aunt, my patient mother, and I think one of my younger brothers. And I think it lasted all of like an hour or two. And <laughs> Entertain, entertain the child. <laughs> Which weapon? Oh, so, so the, you have a choice of things to do with the magic weapon. So, yeah, I used the magic amulet when it asked me which weapon, thinking that this was how you could, could uh, use spells. And so it, I think it's a... <laughs> it's a little bit more intense than that, and probably why it costs 15 gold. <laughs> <laughs> the, the four bad with the two questions, it sounds like it's like it's like a color me bad um, reference there or something. But uh, So if you hit three, will the magic amulet automatically kill the rat? No, it missed. So can you use the magic amulet over and over again? There's no mechanic here for spells spells or spell power or mana or anything like that Attack, shield yeah now you're trying to attack with the magic amulet again I think it's done what happens if you hit yeah done own so you only get one use out of it yeah Huh. So that's like a uh, last last ditch effort. So I feel like it's a bit of a, a, a spoiler from from Jimmy. But this is from Jimmy Mars' article. My understanding is that one of the commands you can use with the magic amulet, and maybe it's the bad command, if you and it's random, but if randomly it will turn you into a lizard man. Mm. And so, if you get turned into a lizard man, it's you're completely overpowered and can kind of run through the game pretty quickly. Oh. Uh, okay, that was interesting. What happened? OBS decided to update, maybe? Oh, don't. <laughs> Just keep attacking until the whole screen <laughs> reemerges. Oh, there we go. Save Barton time. I'm curious what uh, what language this was written in. It's going to be like Fortran or Pascal or some early. Okay. Another thing is perspective is really strange in these. There's also something to how combat in games, I mean, from this point on, with few oddballs, is it's so quick. And it's, there's, and I can just sit here and tap keys. Mm -hmm. Or uh, today I can just sit there and hold down the left mouse button and right. shoot, yep. right? There's really not a whole lot of um, narrative detail or, you know, Nuance and combat is nuanced. I mean, there are things to this, but it, even that game you mentioned before, where there's like if you're hitting body parts, even right. that's a yeah. little bit more. Did you find something? I was I was going to mention this is written in AppleSoft Basic. <laughs> Jeez. So it is basic. Yeah, it is wow. basic, and you're right. High school in Houston, Texas suburbs, uh, beginning first as a school project. Which, I mean, a lot of games did. They, they started out that way. I don't know. That's impressive. This is in a given California Pacific's high royalty rates. Um, the 10,000 copies that were sold of this originally might have been enough. So I guess this is uh, an article's conjecture on how much Richard Gary I would have earned from this game. But to earn $150,000, mm -hmm. um, from my understanding, in 1982, that was like $9 billion, I believe. 
That's pretty good. Yeah, I have no idea what it is. I would have been fine even 20 years later with $150,000 <laughs> as a <laughs> high school true. kid. All right. The game is concepts that later become standard in the Ultimate Series, including first-person gameplay in dungeons. Of course, you know that's going to become ubiquitous throughout the games that we're going to be taking a look at. Requiring food to survive, that's not going to become ubiquitous. That's something that's going to stick with Garriott for quite a while. Top-down overhead worldview. Um, there's other games that did it, but I do think Ultima kind of trailblazed that idea. Mm-hmm. Again, simulationist aspect. Hot keys used for commands. Oh, yeah. I, don't know. I feel like Wizardry does the same thing, and so does Bard's Tale. I don't know if it's... I mean, I guess you could say, I mean, this game comes before them. Well, is that what they're talking about here, where you, I'm hitting a, t- a for attack and rather and than for having food, that, right. But right. you do the same. But you do the same thing in, I mean, I'm thinking wizardry, you do absolutely the same thing as attack, parry, or cast a spell. I mean, and I mean, I don't know if it's a trail, I don't know if that's something that's necessarily trailblazing, because I think it's, you have to because of the time, right? You know, we don't have graphical user mm-hmm. interfaces. Um, we do have joysticks, but I think these games are a little bit more complicated than having just the two inputs of a joystick. Yeah. Use of Elizabethan English. Um, I think that's <laughs> so hilarious. Uh, I, how old? I mean, Richard Gere was a teenager when he wrote this. So, so. so Garriott's agent wrote this Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elizabethan English. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have some Elizabethan scholars I could... Uh... <laughs> so how does this jive with your understanding of Elizabethan English? <laughs> See, but there's. I was hoping. And we never found a castle. I feel like the next one we do Ultima One. I'm gonna. Where are we at here? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Well, we haven't even run across one either, so it's. It, they're obviously not. See, there's no option. Like looking at the manual here, there's no option to do anything but attack. So it's funny that you even have this command. <laughs> like, why are you even prompting me? Can we talk? So th- you have the commands up there now. So the list of arc. Oh, that's the oh, unless it's... Well, you can turn around. I think I tried to run away from the thief at one point. Oh, did you? Yeah, I, I'm. You know, I'm not 100 percent sure. See, I mean, I'm running away, but it's following me. But it's yeah. still kind of interesting. The Bart's Tale and Wizardry games. Well, you could you could flee, but then you would be somewhere really far away. And this one, the technically, you don't get, you don't enter a different version of the game in combat. It's still kind of happening in this 3D space that we're occupying. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I saw the ladder. I was on my way out. Ugh. Now, without a thief, there's no way for us to ever know. And we've never run across spells. As a wizard, the only thing that we know is we can use a magic amulet, but we don't know if we can't use that as a fighter as well. Where's the speed run of the Calabath? <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's something to that. There's This is very... Well, I keep getting... I mean, I'm getting a rogue vibe, right? And I, I feel like it's the... Oh, there's a ladder. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you're right, because there is... And I t- typically think of those roguelikes as more top-down. But there's, like, exploration... You know, How loot, far can you go? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You're but, right. And the, oh. I think these are fascinating too. That so, my understanding of the game then is that the, all these dungeons are being randomly generated. Oh. So I could use that. I can use an axe. That's interesting. Sorry. T- two things I think are really interesting. Also, there is uh, something that Wizardry and Bard's Tale, Bard's Tale would have, I think, in two and three, but not in the first ones. Uh, you have my understanding is we have ranged combat. We can get a we can get farther from the rat and toss the axe at him. Hmm. Um, oh, and we have bows and arrows. That's something that is kind of impressive for this, if that's how it works. The other thing I was going to say was, um, oh, what in the world am I doing? <laughs> uh, let's see, how do I go up? No.
Oh, I know, Russ, because the other thing, and I'm a little bit impressed by this, if, if all of these dungeons are being randomly generated um, based on that seed, there's two holes. That's weird. <sighs> Is that that means that every dungeon has some type of algorithm which determines, which makes sure that you can go down and up and get out. Mm -hmm. Um Assume again, take a little bit more exploration to see whether that's actually true. I'm also curious how big these maps are, like 20 by 20 on a graph. It just occurred to me that the difficulty level on this is three. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, that's probably the way to go for, uh, for one of these playthroughs, but it, it hurts my... <laughs> See now I'm curious about the history of the ro of rogues and roguelikes, kind of net hack and all that stuff because I'm not an expert on those. Well, see so now my oh, I still have an axe, so maybe I still have an extra one. You know, can we solve this game? Is there an ability where you've done all the dungeons and it gives you a little trophy? Oh, for a Calabeth? Yeah. Well, would that be too much narrative though? <laughs> the, the the end game and so uh, oh I think I hit a secret door yeah oh nice you see you think there would be a, something oh yeah I'm gonna be in trouble here if I don't So here, so I'm so I'm cheating here. I'm looking at Jimmy Mars' Digilana Cram page about a Calabeth, mm -hmm. and here's you know it starts off. Now oh. he, so it starts off. This is he. This is he's playing what looks like to me the original Apple II version, and so it's got that screen that we put up there. But it has this opening paragraph. Many, many, many years ago. <laughs> That's a lot of many. That is a lot of many. The Dark Lord Mondane, arch foe of British, traversed the lands of Acalabeth, spreading evil and death as he passed by the as he passed. By the time Mondane was driven from the land by British, bearer of the white light, he had done much damage unto the lands. Tis thy duty to help rid Acalabeth of the foul beasts which infest it while trying to stay alive. <laughs> so the mon so what we do is we do have a narrative here, and you talk about murder hobo. Are literally we are exterminators. Yeah, we are monster exterminators in this game. It's just odd that this is. And it's kind of disappointing. Oh, that's pretty cool. Well, is that like a mantis? These are like graphics that open the game on the Apple II version. Oh wow. You know, a magic amulet would be really nice here because you know, I'm just. So okay. Also, like in later Ultimos, our first real mission must be to find the castle of Garriott's alter ego, Lord British. After calling us a peasant, he will assign us the first of a series of quests to to simply kill monsters of increasing difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> the number of these quests is controlled by the difficulty level we chose at the beginning. Interesting. So we have. So the castle is is kind of important. Yeah. But would we, well, yeah, my prep for this game was, oh. there, there we go, look at that thing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Welcome, peasant, into the halls of the mighty Lord British. Herein thou may choose to dare battle with the evil creatures of the depths for great reward. I'm not sure that comma is necessary, but that's okay. Maybe that's the, uh. William Shatner pause <laughs> for great reward. <laughs> uh, what is and and so now we get to name our character. Pounce. All right. As we are with the uh, University of Milwaukee Panthers. Oh, uh, I was wondering where that was coming no. from. Now I'm a little. Uh... <laughs> It's not Doss Thou, it is Doest Thou Wish for you're, Grand Adventure. You're very loyal to UWM. I, I'm trying, man. <laughs> is this second year for you? Uh, first year. First oh, year. wow. Yeah. Grand Adventure? What happens if you say... I, 
I want to. I mean, what do you say if he says no? You're like, well, what the hell did you boot this program up for? Should we find out? Yeah, Pib now. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, okay. Um, pounce. It changed in the two seconds that we were here. <laughs> uh, you know, you know what it is. It's uh, because you took the caps lock off. Oh, and because it's it, it wants you to always have commands in his uppercase. Well, it's it's like caps lock isn't working here. Uh, try shift. That's interesting. Yeah, there you go. And then try shift. Yes. What yeah. the hell? May I wonder? I wonder if it's. You think it's already got us in as saying no to that? Let's try a different name. Let's see this. Um... You try British. <laughs> you win. I have you tried it both upper and lower case? My life is full of regret now. I mean, it, it's there. We there. Go. Okay. Good. That shall try to become a knight. User error. <laughs> yeah. The first task is to go into the dungeons and to return only. So this is cool. So we actually oh. it's it's Monster Hunter. Yeah. Uh, Forty years before Monster Hunter will come out, we're actually getting a specific monster to kill. Uh, we have to kill an gremlin. Go now upon this quest, and may Lady Luck be fair unto you. Also, I, British, have increased each of thy attributes by one. So, <laughs> so we do. So there is there is a narrative thing. So we, we have Lord British has uh, destroyed. Mondain's going to show up in the other Ultimas. But me, he, get, he didn't bother to give me any food, though. <laughs> so I'm basically dead. <laughs> what did he say? Wait, when we went back, and he said Yahoo's returned, but you haven't killed the Gremlin. What the hell? Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. It, Pounce! I would have used our name. We're no longer peasant. You, thou must kill a n gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> but see, this All is right. this so is where I'm, I get really interested. Um, and of so course, this is like right why before. have the background of Monday, right? Like, so my this is my assumption, which could mm -hmm. be wrong, right? Is that he's basing this game off of his dungeons, his home dungeons and dragons game, right? Yeah. Where his Lord British sounds like one of his characters. Mondain must have been some foe that they had in the D and D game. Yeah. He's 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 creating this world, then, and inside of the Lord British Dungeons and Dragons dioceses that he's doing at home, yeah. because we are not. So we're not. So again, we're. I'm, I'm looking at the narrative elements here. We are not posited as a hero. We are. We begin as a peasant. We are mm -hmm. trying to become a knight. Um. And we are not the, the Lord British is the hero. He's just defeated this mundane character, and we're just we're actually just cleaning up for him. <laughs> Interesting. Right? Like we're the janitors of uh, of a Calabeth. So it's like the uh, the um, universal narrative. <laughs> I've already been taken. I've already done that for you. Uh, yeah. No one ever thinks about the heroes. Uh, made <laughs> I was I mean I've, I've I mean again we, we talk about like game reasons to have you know this mass amount of combat which I think people thought of as I tried to play Wasteland recently the mm. original version have you ever played mm. that because I loved it as a kid but I played it again and I, I people rave about it to this day right the original Wasteland because it, it will maybe we'll get into it at some point on this channel but there's so much combat that I just mm. got tired of it. it's like you can't walk five steps and I think yeah. the same thing is true of Bard's Tale which I worry about too when we get to Bard's Tale because it's and I, I feel like people at the time equated that with I'm getting more gameplay the more monsters that yeah. they can put on the in the box and it's not necessarily that much fun right mm -hmm. um, let me see that in Final Fantasy yeah I mean that's one of the that's true the big frustrations with that it's like the narrative is so compelling and the world is so beautiful mm -hmm. and rich and then you're interrupted by all this combat. I mean, right. it's different from Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. For no other reason, than mechanically, uh, yeah. combat in Dungeons and Dragons takes so damn long sometimes. Um, <laughs> but I much prefer. I mean, I much prefer that. But that doesn't really matter. I, I now we have the question of violence. Is there more violence but in these games? But I mean, combat in D and D is is more compelling and enriched. Enrich again. It's there's there's more. Narrative quality to it. Some depends on the. I mean, depends sure. on the. I mean, we you know we 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 were kind of making the criticism here that like what commands do we have in combat? It's attack, yeah. and that's it. Um, 
but for, first edition Dungeons and Dragons mechanically there's none mm -hmm. mechanically there's nothing more than attacking and hitting I mean I can name all the combat actions in first edition you know it's flee withdraw um, get ready for a charge charge um, and that's about it you know mm -hmm. now you, you got to edition, the third edition Dungeons and Dragons and we have feats and then we have all these things happening anyway digression I I missed everything between Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and Fifth Edition. Basically, there was no no particular reason why. I think I mean the the bottom line was I had just bought. I think Oriental Adventures had come out, <laughs> and I think I was about to buy that. It had been out for a little while, mm -hmm. and then they released the second edition. I was like. <laughs> I just was about that close to completing the library. There, like, I'm not, that was my first taste of uh, uh, planned obsolescence. Right, right. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, second edition Dungeons Dragons is probably the only edition change that was actually needed just because first edition had gotten so crazy. Yeah. Um, and the rules are contradictory. You can look at the player's handbook in first edition and the dungeon master's guide and they have rules that actually contradict each other. Oh, interesting. Um, that comes up a lot. So the, um, I run a first edition campaign again, a digression here. We use a book called Osric, um, which mm. is a... Have you, have you heard about retro clones? Mm -mm. So... Um, is that one where they take like a module from then and then bring it... That's no, a... it's what they do is they because you can't make you can't make new material for the old games because the rights are held um, oh, by like Wizards of the Coast or whoever, right? So the only way for you to make a new module for first edition is for somebody to make a new version of the game that's practically the rule set by using the open game licensing by saying the rules themselves aren't copyright protected, only the flavor text and you know the monsters or names and stuff like those yeah. are protected. So then people can create new modules for the games because they say, like, well we're not making new A D and D games, we're making new Osric games, we're making new Labyrinth okay. Lord. So that's the the idea behind them. And as a matter of fact the person who made Osric didn't hope was hoping people um, what's his name? Sorry, I should know this. Frog God Games. Um, hmm. anyway, Matt Finch, Matt Finch, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so he didn't think people would play Osric, mm -hmm. as it'd be like, I'm using his rule set. Like, this is just to, so we can make new stuff for it. Yeah. But because first edition is such, so all over the place, Osric is a great rule set because it puts it on one place and it's not contradictory anymore. That's what my group actually uses. Sorry, that was a big digression. Um, there's a number of retro clones now. That are out. I mean, there's so many retro clones out. Uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, Labyrinth Lord, Osric, um, What's there, there's a Conan one. There's one that's called uh, Adventure Conqueror King, and they mm. all practically use first or basic uh, Dungeons and Dragons rules. That's so. that's fantastic. That's free knowledge to all you people out there. I mean, it's good to know. I mean, one of my frustrations was someone who kind of left that that world and then came back to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, when when Magic: The Gathering came out, I had roommates who played it furiously. <laughs> And I just couldn't stomach it because of the Wizards of the Coast. Right. And you know, huh. even though I'd been out of D and D for some time, oh no, I played it again back in uh, college. But there, just that frustration of, well, you see where this model is going, you know, and I don't know. Yeah. No, no. I well, that, I mean, that's a bigger. I never got into magic either, um, and it drove me crazy because you know all the local hobby stores suddenly switched from selling yeah. players' handbooks to suddenly nine hundred decks. Um, well, yeah, and I. Uh, I this is uh, maybe we should change this to digression quest. Yes. <laughs> but there's, uh, it, you know, that whole consumption model right. that Wizards of the Coast brings to the table is something that I'm like hawkishly looking for mm -hmm. in even fifth edition. And you see, mm -hmm. you see those things kind of coming into play. Miniatures were not, although miniatures were always a part of D and D. It seems right. my early experience they were unnecessary. Right. They were kind of decoration if you wanted something kind of representational, but they weren't actually used on a map. There right. seems to be so much more than the manuals, paper, and a pencil and right. dice. Well, I think I, don't think, I, I you know, uh, it's these Wizards of Coast being owned by Mattel, it's easy to look for the things. I think they made so many missteps with Fourth Edition Dungeons and Dragons, and I think a lot. I mean, there were a lot of things that were promised with Fourth Edition Dungeons and Dragons that never came true. That I think were with the idea that they wanted to build that model. And of course, mm. Fourth Edition Dungeons and Dragons required miniatures. I didn't play. I always get grief. I, I, I'm sure it's a fun system. I, one of my good friends um, played it quite a bit. Um, 
But they wanted to have a, a full online component for it, too. Like, you were going to register, I think, your character. You're going to be able to play online. And then it was places like Fantasy Grounds and Roll20 uh, who actually did a much better version. Okay. I think Wizards Coast have ever had the capacity to do. Um, I, I feel like 5th Edition, they've done a good job of trying to stay away from that because I think the kind of um, assumptions that we had about that, a prejudice toward, like, what's Wizards Coast going to do? They have to do everything they can to not look that... I mean, they're main competitor you know the pathfinder rpg right now they make so many freaking books yeah. right i mean yeah. you talk about like they want you to stay, and they're all based on subscription processes and yeah. they're a great company run out of i think out of seattle mm. people there really love D, but they are doing the model and wizards of the coast who is this larger corporation is barely creating any books for fifth edition you know it's been yeah. out for a number of years and we've only got like four books uh i don't really i, I do run a very rare i run once a month fifth edition game it's fun Anyway, I, th I I think they're moving the online stuff. Um, you know, Jeff recently went in for the D and D Beyond, uh -huh. and that was an ex that was a costly investment. But that's and there are, and I think there's also. I don't, have you ever been to Gen Con? No, or, I have never been to Gen Con, I mean, and I'm planning on going. A the 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 Paizo booth. I mean, if there's ever a deterrent to just stay away from Pathfinder, it's mm -hmm. the sheer number of books. Right, like you just. Right. I don't even know where to start yeah. with this. Okay, a core rule book, but, um, but the uh, Adventurers League, you know, there's another mm -hmm. this kind of um, maintaining your characters and and participating in that at the um, I can't remember the name of it, the Winter Gaming Con here in Lake Milwaukee. Uh, uh, Gary Con. No, no, in Milwaukee. I didn't it, know about one in Milwaukee. It's that's why I was checking earlier if I was wearing the shirt for it, but. Uh, Anyway, it's in winter. It's right between semesters. It's a. Good, it's actually a lot of fun. But that was my first at the time of Adventures League, and it was like this is the same type of consumption. Like there were people that would kind of drop in the sessions, get the get whatever stats or stuff that they needed, and they mm -hmm. they'd be gone again. There's right. no. It was much like a video game. Yeah. An online game. So interesting how that kind of played out. It's interesting too, by the way, that for Adventures League versus Pi, with, uh, versus Pathfinder Society, you have to register your character for Pathfinder Society mm. with their system before you can play there. Adventures League with Fifth ah. Edition, you could just bring your character up and say that you don't have to register at all. Which, anyway, but again, talking about the differences between those two philosophies. However, um, yeah, I mean, you are supposed to be the chosen one. <laughs> so. so would you like to take one more run through? Yeah, let's do one more and then... <sighs> Had a lot of water. Alright, we got 11 minutes left. We are going to solve it this time. Sticking with that. Lucky number 7. We'll do 5. This is the character that's going to do it. I wonder too how much these abilities, what do they affect, right? There we go. I want to be a fighter. Yeah. Oh, let's see the bone. Oh. First thing I think that we've learned is the importance of reading the manual for these old school games. <laughs> uh, to know that we were supposed to find out, to find British to tell us what we're supposed to do. So that and that's going to be a conceit of this game that's going to appear in every Ultima game. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I couldn't even find the castle. I mean, you, you kind of have to town hop. I think yeah. a little bit, right? What happened? All right, let's see. All right, let's see. That's fine. Oh. Now look at this. So we're surrounded by towns now, so we can go. This is ridiculous. 
This is what the Bay Area looks like. We've got <laughs> Fresno. We're not Fresno. We do Richmond, Martinez, Oakland, San Francisco. I, I can't walk four feet with that hitting. Well, I guess I... All right. It's not even that easy at one. So, what, do we have any closing thoughts? Uh, you know, so now, like, kind of getting the gist of it, this seems like something that would be kind of fun to have, like, in the background. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like... Oh, I wonder, wonder what's going on here, uh, and I don't know. It's like we were saying before. It, it's clumsy. It's an early effort, but uh, I don't know. It it sets the ground for a lot of things to come after it. So yeah, I think it's actually impressive. It, it, in many ways, I think it's actually really impressive for the number of things that that he's doing. I think resurrections misspelled there. Um, Right, two, two R's, S, one two, S's, two S, something wrong. Yeah, did not look wrong. Yeah, resurrection. I think it's one S and two R's. That second R. But I think there's a lot here that, that I'm more impressed with than I thought that I would be. Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, these are these are extreme. I, again, the term is not primitive, but uh, the idea of going to find Lord British out to have some type of storyline, um, I think is actually interesting. Uh, we could. I mean, there's a lot we could talk about. I mean, the fact that you're a peasant and he's a lord is kind of an, actually an interesting position. The fact that we're not heroes, that we're cleaning up after Lord British, I also think is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the world, the nascent world building simulations that he's doing here, I think are interesting. Um, dungeons existing as their own. I wonder if there's a difference in difficulty in each dungeon. There's no order that we have to do mm -hmm. them like we'll have to do later. But I think but there's it, also that, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the how you're just cleaning up after Lord British. It's an important point to make that Richard Garriott is always here. No matter who's playing, where they're playing, Richard Garriott is always the DM. And then I think that's, that's something yeah. when it comes to computer games and world building, there's that desire to to create a place. And it's not necessarily a good thing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so. I'm with you. Sorry to I have to jump because I have to go with you. Alright. Um, all right, cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Ultima the next one. I'll be right back. Alright. Thank you, viewers. <laughs> <laughs> All two of them.